my name is Matt Elliott. I'm the founder of uh, Pulse Financial Planning, located in Rochester, Minnesota. And the, the goal of this presentation really is just to provide a, a broad overview of financial well-being checklist of topics everyone should really address at some point during your career. So it's designed to be a financial planning 101 type of webinar. Hopefully you can come away with um, an idea of what things you're doing, what things you could focus more attention on and pick up a few tips along the way. The target audience here really is just a newer doctor that hasn't had much financial planning done yet, or is looking for a checkup on some of the things that they should be including in their uh, personal financial plan. So we're just going to go over eight steps of things that you should really uh, address at some point during uh, the financial planning process, starting at the bottom here with employer benefits. Uh, and the idea here is just to find where, where you are at personally. Um, you may have addressed some of these steps already. Maybe you're starting fresh, but, uh, uh starting at the bottom here with employer benefits all the way up to um, planning through retirement. Each one of these steps really could have a whole series of webinars on them. We'll just provide an overall outline and some things that you should be aware of and uh, hopefully provide some tips along the way. The first step really before you're looking at doing any other, um, addressing any, any other part of your financial plan would be getting your employer benefits. Um, in a good place. And the reason for that is this is something that's being offered to you, provided by your employer. So before you go out and do anything else, at least take advantage of what uh, your employer is already just uh, giving to you. The first one is at, at the bare minimum, take advantage of the 401k or 403b match that your employer offers. If they offer one, um, nowadays employers, uh, they default you to contributing to the match amount and usually will put you in a target date fund. So if you do nothing in this case, or at least doing the bare minimum of where you're at, I, I would just make sure, verify that you are getting at least the amount to get your employer's match. Other employer benefits to look out for, common ones are going to be some type of healthcare savings account that your employer may offer. Um, usually you'll have two options depending on which type of employer plan uh, or excuse me, healthcare plan you, you are selected on. If you are on a... Uh, kind of a more standard healthcare plan, uh, you have access to a health flex savings account. The health care savings account is specifically for those on a high deductible health care plan. And I generally will, will say first, look at what your expected health care expenses are and then pick the right health care plan for you. If that happens to be a high deductible health care plan, um, I would definitely take care of the, or take advantage of the health care savings account. Um, that's actually going to be a triple tax advantaged account that you have access to only if you have that specific type of high deductible healthcare plan. Um, you can't get much better than triple tax free. So that means money that goes in is not taxable when it come, comes out for a qualified expense. It's uh, tax free and it grows tax deferred. So if you have gains in there, could you invest those funds? That's all going to grow on a tax deferred basis. As long as it's either used for healthcare uh, expenses. Or the kind of nice caveat with the HSA is once you turn age 65 or older, um, you can withdraw that money penalty free as well. So there's not you know, much of a risk of contributing too much there with healthcare costs these days. It's likely you're going to use it. If you're fortunate enough to where you're save, saving that account and don't end up needing it, um, it's going to be there for after age 65 penalty free with the health. And, and the nice thing about the health savings account is it is a use it or lose it type of account. So you can consult. Make sure if you have a health flex savings account, you're not just socking away money in there. Only plan on contributing the amount that you expect to have in healthcare costs, whether that's from known appointments you have every year for maintenance or prescription costs, uh, things like that. But you don't want, you want to make sure you're not over contributing to the health flex savings account, but it is still good to take advantage of because you can avoid um, paying any types of uh, taxes on that income that goes into that account that's used for, for healthcare costs. Those are common accounts that are good uh, to take advantage of. The dependent care flex savings account is another common benefit that your employer may offer. You know, it can be used for eligible uh, dependent care expenses. Most commonly, that's going to be for if you have kids in daycare, childcare, um, things that qualify um, those types of expenses. Uh, delegate how much money you want to be added to the dependent care FSA during open enrollment. Um, same idea as the health flex savings account. It is a use it or lose it type of account. Um, so don't contribute more there than we're going to have in eligible expenses the following year, but 
by funneling some of your paycheck through that account and you avoid income taxes, payroll taxes, and things like that. That's good to take advantage of if you're going to have those eligible dependent care expenses. Um, so really just, you know, the foundation here, but those are the three that most employers offer, but also take a look at what other benefits your employer may offer. Common one that I'm seeing more commonly for docs now are things like, uh, tuition re well, student loan repayment assistance. Some employers are offering that some type of tuition reimbursement I've seen, um, as well. You really have to just d dive into your employer's benefits package and talk to HR and don't be sure about reaching out to them. They're generally pretty helpful with at least, uh, directing you to some benefits that might be useful for you. Uh, I'm in Rochester, Minnesota, so in the shadow of Mayo Clinic here. So a couple common ones that are a little bit more unique that I see commonly are uh, legal insurance. That's one that I do have people take advantage of frequently. If you ha have legal insurance through your employer and you don't already have an estate plan set up, there's an opportunity to add legal insurance for the upcoming year, get your estate planning documents drafted through one of the attorneys that accepts that legal insurance and will commonly have uh, estate plans drafted that include healthcare directives and wills, uh, powers of attorney, trusts, you know, something that might cost thousands of dollars will only cost, you know, a couple hundred dollars at the most, um, by you know, signing up for that legal insurance, just knowing how to turn that's something that you are going to need in the near future. And it is really common, especially for younger docs. Most of the time when I talk to someone, they don't already have estate planning shut off their list yet. Well, certainly once you have kids, that's something that you want to make sure that you do address a legal insurance is something that can help offset the cost of that. And, and I do see some, um, employers offering financial planning, uh, assistance. So Mayo Clinic actually offers staff certified financial planners that, um, are on staff at Mayo that, that help physicians with financial planning. I've also seen some hospitals, uh, that don't have on staff financial planners, but they may have, uh, some type of reimbursement a thousand dollars or some set amount that can be used for eligible financial planning services. So, uh, that's another thing dig into your employer's benefits packages and just take a look at what makes sense for you. A couple other newer ones that I'm thinking of, um, that are situational, but things to be aware of, um, if your employer offers hospital indemnity insurance and you're planning to potentially have a child in the upcoming year, that's a, a good benefit to add. Um, and if some of these, you know, planning based on your, your situation, these are one of these things that insurers are pretty, may not offer certain types of insurances if just to go out in the marketplace because, uh, they don't want people that know that they're going to have kids are going to be in the hospital signing up for those, but through a group benefit, like your employer, um, you have access to those because they're just offered through everybody through the, uh, employer. So. If you add hospital indemnity insurance, you have the hospital, the baby delivered at the hospital, um, presumably they'll pay out a lump sum for you, um, for that hospital stay, usually some money for the child as well. And then also oftentimes, unfortunately, newborns are a little bit more likely, whether it's a virus or something to, you know, to be hospitalized. Actually for my family last year, um, we added that um, hospital indemnity insurance and our newborn was hospitalized twice with some viruses and things. And then my wife, of course, was hospitalized with delivering, um, the baby. So that was thousands of dollars, just kind of looking at our benefits and thinking ahead that, uh, that we were able to take advantage of just knowing that the, the baby was going to be coming in the following year. So little things like that, just get really familiar with what uh, benefits your employer does offer and think about your situation. What's coming up in the next year during open enrollment and, and take full advantage of what, what do you have offered to you? The next step would be addressing the budgeting and you no, know, it's a budgeting is a simple concept to understand. It is one of the more actually difficult ones I've seen, you know, regardless of how much money to, to implement the formula is pretty simple. We want to be spending less than you earn so that in these future steps, we can figure out a plan for what are we doing with the savings, um, that we have left over at the end of each month. So there's no silver bullet, unfortunately, and I've looked, uh, for budgeting tools. Really, it comes down to just pick something that you think you'll, you'll be comfortable with and have some, be able to have some success with and more important than which tool you use. It's more a matter of allocating some time, setting some time on your calendar every other week or 
every week at once a month, just more frequently is better so that you don't have a, a, you know, a long list of transactions and things to look back at. But your biggest indicator of success with the budget is just going to be allocating some time to look at it and get a good feel for how much money is coming in each month, how much uh, you know, money is going out and where that money is going. And a part of this is just, you know, getting a baseline for how much you're spending each month so that we can know how much you're saving and then allocate those savings into uh, the, maybe the most optimal savings account or place for that money to go. Um, but it's also, I think, helpful in aligning some of your, your personal beliefs and goals with where your spending is at. So oftentimes, and this is, I think, part of the roadblock with budgeting, mm -hmm. but it can be painful to look at how much you spend on something and, and it, it, where you spend your money is totally up to you. But if you're feeling bad about how much money you spent on Z, maybe that's an indicator. That's an area that we can make, make some cuts just so that your spending is in line with your values and, and what you're wanting to do with it. You can make some of those informed decisions rather than just spending or driver behavior tools that I'm a spreadsheet guy. So that's what I use. That's what I like. I think there's some value to actually manually having to pull up your credit card statement and, and enter things onto the spreadsheet because you're actively having to think about it. And that's what budgeting is. It's not just looking back at last month and see, oh, how much money did I spend? How much money did I make? Oh, I, you know, spent more than I made. That's the backwards looking uh, piece of budgeting that I think a lot of people get into. That's not particularly helpful. We want to be mindful of where, uh, where that money is going throughout the week and throughout the month. Uh, so a spreadsheet, I think is helpful with that. Something like make.com is free and it's a great tool. It does a lot of that manual work for you. Um, and I do like Mint, but you still have to make the effort to make it, go in there and keep, keep track of where, where the money is going. And, and sometimes I've seen the problem with Mint being, it's so good at categorizing transactions, the thing you just don't even, you know, look at it and take much of an active role with the budget. So, um, something to be aware of. I think Mint is great, but just be aware that it does require some effort on your part for, for it to work. Uh, you need a budget.com is another common one. Mint is free. Uh, so some might look at that as a pro. Some might look at that as a con, uh, depending on your, your point of view, you need a budget is a paid, I think last time I looked, it was $11 a month. Uh, and that one is a little bit more focused on categorizes things a little bit for you, but it, it's a little bit more hands-on and helping you keep track of drop them up where, where it funds are going. So it's a little less intuitive and a little more work than maybe something like Mint. Um, but that's one that people that put the effort in um, really tend to like. Pen and paper, the point is find something that you're just going to spend the time on and sit down and do. Uh, just applying that baseline of where the spending is, of how much savings you have each month. And and uh, the, the method is going to be less important than uh, the actual time spent on that. So once you've done that, you have a good idea of how much you're spending each month, how much you're making each month, and therefore, you know, comfortable, you're creating positive monthly cash flow and start thinking about where, to, what do we want to do with this extra money that we have each month that we are saving. The next piece that we would look at tackling with that would be paying off debt. And now I don't look at it as simple as necessarily paying off all debt. There's some debt that we might actually want to hang on to most commonly that's going to be maybe a mortgage, uh, got a mortgage lately. Um, this is spring of 2023. Interest rates are a little bit higher, so we might want to consider paying some of that off. But I usually try to look at any debt or loans that you have above 5%, usually consumer debt. So if you have credit card debt, certainly car loans, things like that, consider funneling that monthly savings that you have towards reducing that debt load. And, um, if you have something like a mortgage at two and a half percent, I don't, I wouldn't feel in a, in a huge hurry, especially right now to, to pay that off. Um, that's actually a, a rate that's less than we're seeing in inflation right now. And we maybe just have some other opportunities that we could use that money for that could be uh, in the long run, uh, pay off more than paying off the loans. But if you're starting to look at loans that you have that are six, seven, eight percent, I look at picking that off early as almost the equivalent of getting six, seven, eight percent guaranteed rate of return on some type of investment, which is a guaranteed rate of return. But that would be pretty, um, pretty attractive to me. And that's where I draw that line. But some people, if you're really debt averse and you want to get, you know, pay off more debt, 
I would look at that as a more conservative approach. I've also seen people that are debt averse and, and have that as a, a goal that motivates them. That's a, a good trait to have. And in the long run, I think you'll be successful too. So, you know, trying to you know, provide some rules of thumb here, but um, uh, the, the one caveat to something that you really want to give some extra attention to with the debt and the loans would be the, um, your student loans. So if you have student loans, those require a kind of a separate piece of attention uh, as far as a strategy, particularly if you're working at an employer that may be eligible for, for public service loan forgiveness. There are specific strategies that you're going to want to you know, look at implementing there to minimize the payment loads when they resume to maximize the amount that can be forgiven at the end of your 120 uh, qualified payments. And so you don't necessarily just want to refinance that into the lowest interest rate you can get, because once you go from a federal direct loan over to private, you're going to lose a lot of those benefits, including public service law forgiveness. So there are uh, a lot of benefits to those federal student loans that you want to consider and not just the interest rate um, necessarily. So just make that caveat there. Student loans do require their own special planning outside of your other debt. Once you're in a good place there where you feel like you don't have any high interest rate or consumer debt and you've got a plan for your student loans, um, really the next step would be getting a, an emergency fund put into place. And so generally something around three to six months of expenses. So go back, let's go back and look at that budget and hey, we spend $5,000 a month, somewhere between maybe the 15 to $30,000 range would be reasonable. Uh, as far as a, a, an emergency fund, now for spending fifteen thousand dollars a month, you're going to want to up that up a, a little bit just in case something does happen where you're, you're going to have more leeway there on a, a more of a runway if something were not expected to occur. I usually look at around three to six months of your expenses. You just want locked away in something that's safe, not invested. So places that you can put that would be your just your existing bank account. We are seeing. Now with interest rates being higher, some more attractive uh, places that you can keep your emergency fund, like an online high yield savings account. I just looked at these recently and Ally is, is a online bank that I don't have any relationship with them, but they, when I look uh, for uh, good interest rates, that's FDIC insured, they tend to be always on the competitive side of that. So I think they were around 3.75% was what they were yielding. Last I looked, that's always going to change based on the interest rate environment, but Ally is a good bank. And, and the other thing that I like about Ally, it's a bit of a side too, but um, they do allow for trust accounts to be opened up and trust trusts to be set up as beneficiaries. Going back to your estate plan, not all online banks do allow that. I think Marcus is one other popular one that has a, a good yield, um, but if you set up your estate plan, you're not going to be able to have trusts and things handled there at Marcus. So that's another plus for Ally, uh, that they do allow some of those types of things. And so that, that's a good place to uh, maybe keep some money market funds or another uh, good place. I, I use the Schwab money market funds myself. I, when I last looked, that was around 4.9% is what that was yielding, which is higher than the online, uh, high yield savings account. It's not FDIC insured. So that's something to be aware of any money you put in. An FDIC insured bank, you're going to be insured up to $250,000 of your own deposits, $500,000, which a joint account, uh, something happens to that bank, which we've seen, you know, recently, that's going to be, uh, insured money funds in the money market are not FDIC insured. They're invested in essentially short-term paper, things that are considered safe. Um, but, um, you're not guaranteed to get your full principal back. No, it, that hasn't, the last time we saw some challenges there was in 2008, 2009 crisis when money market funds ended up being made whole there. Just be aware that's not, you'll get a higher interest rate there in exchange for not being FDIC insured. That's how I look at it. So, but, and, and the idea with the emergency fund and, and the reason why I actually put this after paying off debt is the whole purpose of having an emergency fund is to avoid having to go back into debt. So if something happens, uh, car breaks down heaven forbid, have a lapse in employment for one reason or another, you have those funds that you can draw on. And also I think there's just a positive mental, uh, peace of mind knowing that you have a buffer there. So, um, but the idea is it, it'll just prevent us from having to go 
back into debt and credit cards and things that hopefully we, you know, we already addressed in the last stage. Once you got these first four pieces I look at is just the foundation to really focus on that we, we want to really go out and do a lot more in-depth financial planning. Sometimes I'll have people they'll reach out to me and they're really stuck on paying off debt and there's lots of problems there. Well, there's only so much that I, or, or budgeting, that's actually a common one too, where there's only so much that you can do with a financial plan. Um, if you're not saving every month, uh, we, we really need to address that before we have much success with anything else. So once you have those four kind of foundations in, in place, that's where I think it makes sense to you know, really sit down and create a financial plan. So some ideas of some topics to cover, certainly those first four steps we already talked about, write those down, include those in the plan, but you also want to add it, things in like financial goals. If you're on a position salary, personally, I don't think that there's any reason that you need to take out a car loan and you get the next car and you know, if you're planning on getting a car in a few years or five years, whatever it is, it, make a plan for upcoming short-term goals that maybe we'll save for that ahead of time and then pay cash for it rather than taking out loans for things that we could potentially be avoiding again, going back into that issue. So identifying short-term goals like that, maybe cars or maybe you know, things that are short-term, maybe intermediate goals. If you have kids going to college, those are some things that we'll, you might want to plan for um, and include in your financial plan. Certainly retirement is always going to be a, a big topic uh, to make sure that you cover tax planning. So tax planning, I, I look at through a little bit different novel lens as maybe uh, your accountant might. I, I try to look at tax planning as how do we minimize your tax bill over your lifetime? And so that can be looking at decisions around, do you want to be making pre-tax traditional uh, contributions to your 403B or Roth contributions? Where you're at in your income level and age and career stage, there could be uh, differences there. Maybe doing Roth conversions in certain years, doing backdoor Roth, uh, those, those types of things that uh, you'll want to address as far as tax planning to make sure that you're just being efficient with the tax fees, not paying more than you have to. Investment strategy is something that um, you want to cover in your financial plan. Again, this is just a so uh, intro kind of one-on-one on some things to start thinking about with the financial plan, uh, investment strategy, my belief is pretty, a pretty straightforward and boring one, but use low cost index funds, diversify, uh, you know, look at how long until you might need the money, how comfortable are you with fluctuations and set up your allocations accordingly, um, and just passive management and then rebalance your, um, uh, your portfolio periodically as well. I do a quarterly that you can maybe get away with doing uh, rebalancing annually if, if you know, don't want to deal with it as frequently. Um, but rebalancing is just going to make sure that when you set up your investment strategy, that you're going back in there and uh, adjusting it uh, and, and resetting back to what your original strategy was. Because if you just make some investments and um, don't look at them or, or touch them over time, your portfolio will start to drift. And what tends to happen there is over the long run, maybe some of your riskier investments, your growth oriented stocks um, might perform better than some of the more stable pieces of your uh, portfolio that you wanted to own as well. And so if you don't touch it over the long run, maybe your risky part of your portfolio, it is taking up a larger percentage than what you originally wanted it to. And that happens simultaneously with when you're getting older and maybe you want to not only be keeping your risk to where it was originally, but maybe periodically reviewing and starting to scale back risk as you get closer to retirement age or the age where you might need to be drawn on those funds. A brief piece on the investment strategy. I think so setting up a, a passive strategy that is, is low cost and, and rebalancing it, um, it's, that's something that should be included in your financial plan. We already talked about estate planning a little bit, but that's something that you certainly will want to address, especially after you have kids insurance. Um, another one that's important, but especially important if you have kids or when you have kids, my, my philosophy when it comes to insurance is don't get more than you need. We, I generally recommend that we use some term life insurance uh, or just based on, you know, what, what your need might be. And generally, I think if I'm doing my job and if you're, you know, creating a good financial plan, you don't have, you shouldn't have a huge need for life insurance. After your kids are out of the house, you have, at that point, most of your earnings years are behind you. 
Um, so you can, essentially you can save some money by not getting permanent life insurance where you're insured for the long run, but just insured when you need it, which is why the kids are in the house and you still have a lot of years of earnings ahead of you. Long-term disability is another one. Most employers will provide some level of long-term disability, but you will want to look at the policy and see how much is covered. Oh, if something were to happen to you, would it be able to support the lifestyle that you want to be able to maintain in the bare minimum that you are able to work in your occupation? What is the definition of disability that your um, insurance policy provides is important as well. Uh, some might use a d definition of disability of if you can do any occupation or any job, then you're not disabled. Meanwhile, if you have a lot of student loan debt and you're used to a certain lifestyle, you spent all of these years studying in school, that might not be able to support a minimum wage job is going to be able to support what you worked hard to do. So you might want to look at supplementing that with a uh, own occupation definition of disability, long-term disability policy. So something to look out for there um, on the insurance piece, retirement planning, of course, is a, a big piece in your financial plan to thinking about when you want to retire, what does that look like? Um, or maybe you might but plan on retiring. Um, push 55, I have some clients that maybe look at, you know, why I, I just want to get to a point where I'm working by choice and, uh, and then I'll probably continue to work, uh, but I just want to be in case, especially with the stress that physicians are under, um, just don't want to be under that burden no. of uh, having to work on it if you're completely burnt out and have some flexibility there. So building, building that into your financial plan is something that I would recommend that you do as well. And in today's age, I know Andwise is creating tons of uh, free education. There's an unlimited number of resources out there to help think about each one of these topics. So if you are the, a kind of a DIY person, and if you're watching this webinar, it's probably where you're at. I, I think that's great to really look at your own, take your own financial future and picture, uh, and, uh, take it into your own hands. Um, I put this on here just it, if you're at a place where you are researching some of these things and you're looking and you're not sure or not where to go for help, here's the three things that I would just look for if you're hiring someone. And if they meet these three criteria, I think they would do good work for you at a, at a transparent, in a transparent way. Um, you know, I'm a financial planner. I think my financial planning industry has done a good job of, uh, making a bad name for itself for a lack of sure, a better way to put it. So, um, look out for these three things. The person that you hire should have taken a, a sworn fiduciary oath. And so that's not just someone saying, you know what, I'm going to do what's best for you at your advisor and make sure it's in writing and that they can verify that they have a, a fiduciary oath. They're not just saying that they have a legal obligation to put your interests ahead of their own. And if they don't, they can basically they're going to be legally liable for that. That would be something to look out for. And if, if your advisor isn't willing to take that oath, I would wonder maybe why is that? And um, just, just would be a red flag. So fiduciary would be a big pins. B only is another one that's a little less known, uh, known about, I think the fiduciary piece, but basically that just means that the ad advisor doesn't accept commissions and there's a transfer clause involved. So, um, I think there's a lot of just conflicts of interest that can occur when you're getting compensated more to sell one type of insurance policy versus maybe recommending no insurance at all, or maybe we're, maybe we'll save a little bit more of that money that we'd be allocating um, to a IRA account, but maybe we put that into your 403B because your investment options are better. Because there's lots of little things that can happen, uh, the compensation piece. So, um, I think fee only means that advisor doesn't cut commissions and there will be a transparent cost, which is going to be a cost no matter who you hire. But I think, um, it will some of the conflicts of interest by paying someone you know, with a flat rate or, or a transparent rate cuts down on some of that. And the last piece is a certified financial planner. I bring this up, you know, particularly for well, physicians that I talk to, because I think you, know, you pass board exams and schooling and residency, and all these things to be able to call yourself a medical doctor. Um, Unfortunately, there's not much like that exists in the financial planning world. So the certified financial planner is the, the closest that we have to that, where you do have a rigorous curriculum, a board exam, and then experience requirements that are need to be met before you can use the CFP marks as well. Those are three things to, to look out for if you are um, considering hiring a financial planner. 
once you've created your financial plan, one of the first things that we're going to want to address is going to be saving for retirement um, within the financial plan. And so I have some 2023 numbers on the screen here for maximum contributions to either a 403B or a 401k. After that, you might want to consider contributing to an IRA. And now, depending on your income levels, you may not be eligible to contribute to a Roth IRA. And contributions to a traditional IRA would be and may be considered tax deductible. So if that's the case, you could consider looking at um, doing a strategy like a backdoor Roth IRA if you're eligible, which are some steps to that. But um, that would just be another place that you could sock away a little bit more money for retirement that's going to be tax advantaged. And I talked about this a little bit in the tax planning piece earlier, but also probably every year you should be reviewing and considering, do we want to be making traditional contributions or Roth contributions to our retirement accounts, what their tax bracket are going to be this year versus maybe when we're going to be withdrawing the funds and that. use that to help, help guide which decision is going to be best for you. Um, and then you may have some other retirement savings vehicles that you want to include in the plan. Also, your employer may offer a pension. A deferred compensation, oftentimes those will be called 457 plans that your employer may offer, like a backdoor Roth. Only a few, but some employers will allow uh, basically some additional funds to be put into your, uh, for uh, your employer retirement plan and convert it to Roth uh, beyond the 22,500 limit for 2023. Those are some other places that can potentially either sock away some more money for retirement on or count on, including as far as what, what income will be when you do retire, that's a pension. And beyond that, I really would focus on retirement savings first, because really, I think you want to make sure that you're, you're covered before we start looking at doing maybe other goals or other things that could be funding from alternative sources, um, when the time comes, but common other goals that I see are going to be college for kids. 539 plans are a popular option for that. Uh, those allow for tax free earnings to be used for a qualifying expense. Now the money that goes in there, you don't get a tax break on federally. Most states do offer a state income tax deduction, but not all of them do. Uh, so check with your state and some states require you to use their state's 529 plan uh, to get that state tax deduction. Some states don't require you to use their own plan. So something to be aware of and, and look at when you're doing the 529 contributions is what state are you in and which plan might you need to use to get your state's uh, income tax deduction. Another thing that was just recently added though, with the secure 2.0 act with uh, 529 plans is actually down the line. If the money ends up not getting used for qualified education expenses, there's some provisions and there's lots of stipulations around this, but there are some provisions where that money could be put into a Roth IRA. So let's say you know, your child doesn't end up needing the money or they don't go to school, they start a business, they do something else. There's some provisions on some ways that you could get that money into a Roth IRA for that person rather than have to essentially take a, a tax penalty if you take the money out. Um, other common types of accounts that you might want to consider after your uh, maxing out your retirement accounts for, for kids would be custodial accounts. Um, main difference there between a 539 plan and a custodial account, just a custodial account could be used for anything. And also when you put the money in a custodial or sometimes it's called UGMA UGMA accounts, Uniform Gift to Minors Act or Foreign Transfer to Minors Act, depending on which state you're in. The money, when you put it in there is considered the minor's assets at that time. That money, um, you, you're, essentially you direct how it can be invested, um, but it's considered the child's money, not money that you can take out and use for your own purposes down the line if you wanted to. In the 529 plan, you retain a bit more control and you can actually transfer that money to someone else's 529 plan or decide that they, if you want to take it out and pay penalties on it, um, things like that. Something to look out for in a custodial account and would be considered some minor's assets and put the money in there. And then I just, there's some other couple types you can consider to prepaid tuition, treasury bonds, covered all education savings accounts or other um, options to consider if you're wanting to um, save for a child. And then other common goals that you might want to, that I used to see people want to maybe consider uh, saving for uh, either a vacation home or upgrading your home, caring for parents, travel fund, vehicles. Earlier, the, 
I think these are some things that you might want to include in your plan, especially thinking about ahead of time. We don't want to be going into debt or taking money from retirement accounts and paying penalties, taxes on them if we're wanting to uh, buy our next vehicle or uh, buy that vacation, all things like that. So certainly factor other goals into uh, into the financial plan as well. And the last piece, and I think this one maybe gets overlooked, really needs to be addressed as well is to stay the course once you've got your investment set up, you're hopefully diversified, you're rebalancing regularly, you're using index funds. And when I say stay the course, I'm talking about not only the plan and you should be updating the financial plan periodically to every six months to a year. Um, but with the investments, I see a lot of people potentially get off track with trying to time the market or consider that, you know, the depth was different. There's always going to be different volatility events in the market. And I think if there's money that you're saving for retirement or funds that are going to be used long-term down the road, I really wouldn't swipe any uh, volatility in the short term. Money that you might need in a year, two, three years, for some of the goals we talked about, I wouldn't invest that money at all, to be honest with you, because I don't want to invest money not knowing what's around the corner and then having to sell those funds to to take it out um, in a down market at a loss. So um, think about your time horizon and setting aside money, maybe so say bank accounts, money market funds for things you might need in the next couple of years, and then really you know using that to help enable you mentally and then also just financially to be able to stay the course and weather any storms that we might have when it comes to volatility that will continue to see in the market. That's, that's never going to go away. So those are kind of the, the intro eight steps to a lot of the things that I really would think about big picture wise when it comes to just setting yourself up for, for long-term financial success. So I uh, definitely wish you the best of luck and thanks for listening.